been a minute since I've seen everybody. I don't have much of a plan <laughs> for this space. I just wanted to talk to everyone, really, see how everyone's doing, talk about some of the stuff going on right now. And I'm just gonna say what's on my mind, which is mostly how I do everything. I don't know if people know this, but I'm not much of a planner. Even podcast episodes, like I'll have a rough outline, but generally I'm just following the flow of either what I think is interesting, what I think people want to hear about, or what's on my mind at the moment. So this is going to be no different, especially for such an impromptu session. But I think we have a lot to talk about, so I'm excited. And I definitely want to make this more of a conversation than just me talking at everyone, although I will I do have a lot of topics to cover and probably a lot of things to say if you coax it out of me. So anyone who wants to be on stage, be part of the conversation, definitely encourage you to request and come on up here. I don't want to be up here all alone. But yeah, with that said, I think, wow, what, a, what an interesting time. And these are my favorite times in the crypto space. I've been through a lot of different cycles in this crypto universe ever since the first cycle. And what we're feeling right now is sort of emblematic of a time that has been felt before many times which is like maximum despair, maximum hopelessness, people all just kind of like whatever, whatever things they're telling themselves to like cope with a little bit of market downturn has been turned for a lot of people into full on like, oh God, is this it? Is it all over? It's not, of course, as it wasn't before. This is still the fastest growing industry out there. And this, especially Helium, is one of the fastest growing projects out there. And so, of course, no, nothing is over. Nothing is ending. And these are my favorite times because uh, a few reasons. First of all, these are the moments when builders just get to build without all the noise. I think it can be super distracting to be watching price charts and watching hype. And on one hand, you're building something. It's really exciting when the hype is going crazy because it's exciting to get people to use what you built. But at the same time, super distracting, especially when... For some of these projects, what you really need to do to be successful is to just heads down focus. And so I'm like a heads down focus type person, very much an engineer. And I really like the quiet moments where we can just sit down, build, focus on thinking about what needs to be next and how we can make things better. And it also, another reason I like this time is because like that max pain inflicts like motivation. If you're like me and you really believe in the space and you really believe in the merits of decentralization. And if you believe in the idea of why we need to build what we're building, then I don't know, there's something about feeling knocked down that just really brings out the fighter. And me, and I think a lot of other people too, people who really care about the fundamentals of the space are just thinking now, okay, well, whatever is happening now, whether it's Helium related, Solana related, or just like whole crypto market related, how can we do better? How can we build stuff that makes the value of our space so dead obvious that people won't have to think twice next time. People won't have to consult media headlines to decide whether or not they think Helium is a viable project or Solana is a viable project or even Bitcoin is a viable project. How can we build things that just speak for themselves, that are so useful, that are so much better than what's out there that people are just convinced just by using it? Kind of like the iPhone. That was a moment when a lot of people went from, oh yeah, like a computer and a phone, whatever, to, oh shit, this is really useful. And it doesn't really matter what anyone else's opinion is about it because I see it and I'm using it and it's just better. And I think in the crypto space, we have a lot of progress to make to get to an iPhone moment. I think we're still at like under 100 million people in the world who've even used crypto and probably way less that are active, although growing very fast. And there, there are some really key problems, no pun intended, but I think key custody is one of those things that's just not solved yet. Like you, you can either use an insecure hot wallet in your browser or an app on your phone, which is better, but still not great, or a ledger. And there needs to be an in-between for people. No one's parents are going to use this stuff until it's as easy as Apple Pay and as secure as Apple Pay, right? Um, if we're talking about just like payments and just day-to-day -day usage. So there's a lot of progress to be made to, to get to that point. And I think that's something that builders in the space have been aware of from the beginning, but it's just another one of those things where it's just, there's just like a lot in the way. There's a lot of weeds that need to be cleared before we can get to that place. And it's just crazy to step back and think how nascent that problem alone is in terms of solutions. Like the Solana phone is basically the first solution of 
a mobile phone paired with a secure element that can store your private key, right? Basically an unhackable, I guess you could call it cold wallet inside of a phone. That, that is, in my opinion, the level of security and ease of use that's necessary to bring mass adoption in the general crypto space. But yeah, another thing I really like about these quiet periods is some people don't realize how much of an opportunity it is to start mining right now. If you're optimistic about the future, you can go on eBay right now. You can see that there are sense caps selling for a hundred bucks, for example, right? After every single wave of downturn in Bitcoin and Ethereum, like I, I think that people have this, this idea in their head that mining is this thing that's like easy come, easy go, where people will start getting into mining and then the moment it's not profitable, they'll sell. I think that's somewhat true in Bitcoin and Ethereum, but even the people who gave up on those things and sold out and didn't keep mining, those are probably some of the people who had the worst outcomes in terms of they missed out on all the mining and the price was low and then it went back to crazy all-time highs. And think about Helium. The dynamics are quite different. In Bitcoin and Ethereum mining, you have a main input cost, which is electricity. And the reason people give up on that so fast is because the electricity cost just becomes unprofitable. Now, the true believers do stay, right? But you still see when there's a cycle downturn, like there's a big outflow of people who are just in it for the short-term profit. Helium has different dynamics, though. The cost to run a miner, once you have it, is, it basically rounds to zero compared to what you earn, even at the current HNT price, right? You're basically always going to be profitable as long as you have at least one or two other hotspots to POC with. Now, I think we may need better tooling to like redistribute hotspots because there's still issues with trust around getting a used hotspot from someone, especially on a place like eBay. But this could be an amazing time to redistribute, especially the ones that are like in deep, dense city locations and take them out to basically the middle of nowhere where a person who just believes in the network can pay a hundred bucks, set up a miner that covers 10 miles in the countryside and just leave that on. And you can see it in the numbers, right? There's almost a million hotspots onboarded and there's still five, 600,000, I think close to 600,000 online. And that's remarkable considering that we've seen a, like a 95% price drawdown. So that kind of just shows you that the network is not going to disappear overnight by any means. It's not like Bitcoin and Ethereum in that way. And for new people who are looking to get in, this moment provides an amazing opportunity for them to pick up a miner for very cheap. And a quick plug for Fair Spot, we're still giving out free miners, keep 70%, and we'll have more news soon. So let's see, we have a request. All right, Ed, welcome up here, Ed. I'll stop my monologue for the moment and, and say, hey, how are you, Ed? Hey, what's up, Armand? How's it going? How are you feeling? How are things in, in your side of the helium world? Uh, I am busy basically the whole family has that whatever rsv or something is going around everybody's affected so other than that it's been like you said heads down what can i do what things are still building in the middle of crypto winter that that still sound good and are appealing and some ideas and i'm amazed at the like you said in the silence the clarity of some things that emerged you're talking about the solana phone and i was thinking about man it would be amazing if led if there was a ledger device that just natively worked on helium so you could sign your transactions via helium and i was like oh man that would be an amazing thing i think it was it happened when ledger i don't know retweeted something that helium put out the other day and i was like yeah that'd be a great idea i'm curious what you mean by that because ledger does work with helium as of now so all, like basically when you sign those transactions that you would no longer have to do it through your computer, that it would just communicate and sign them over the Helium network. Like that would just, you'd be able to plug in via that. Oh yes, absolutely. This is an idea I've toyed with over and over in my head. I think it's such an awesome idea and an underappreciated use case. Let's sign crypto transactions and send them over the Helium network. It's such a perfect application because the transactions are so small, right? They're the perfect size to fit in a Helium packet, in an IoT packet. And it's, it's just fast enough, right? It doesn't need to be like microsecond real time or whatever. Zero setup. And low power consumption, the battery life can be incredible. And the security is high because these devices can be limited, like Helium devices can be limited to doing a very small amount of functions, just like any hardware wallet. So basically, just like you're saying, almost imagine a ledger with, instead of a USB port on the side, like a Helium LoRa chip inside it. You could do so much cool stuff with that. Yep. And I was talking in New York with Jose 
And we, I was sharing my idea for the Helium network, my little device idea. And it wasn't until a few weeks ago. And then I thought about this ledger application. I was like, I think that this is the better idea. And I was like, it bummed me out to say it to myself. But I was like, I think it's way better. It'd be so cool to get that done. And then if there was a type C, then device and we supported that, then we could get on to the like more, like very quickly, like payment transactions, like at a gas station type of application, which would be very, very exciting as well. Yeah. Like I have an endless backlog of, of helium related ideas in my head, like almost all of which I don't pursue just because it's not my natural, I guess it doesn't fit my skill set the most, but one is definitely something very close to what you're suggesting, which is like a credit card sized thing. And just to preface this, we've seen things that are like credit card size, but much thinner than a credit card running on Helium. These, I think it's nano things, the trackers. So we know that can- Yes, those are amazing. Those are amazing. Like a nano thing size tracker, except it's the size of an actual credit card and the shape of an actual credit card has some sort of like e-ink display and like an NFC chip and a LoRa chip in it, all of which is totally feasible to fit in that size of a device. And it's just like a really simple, like basically a stable coin credit card that you could use to pay in certain places. So it could sign transactions and it could show you the balance in real time, just like numbers, right? Numbers in the middle of the card, just showing your current balance. Super, super simple. It does one thing and one thing really well. I love it. Say less. Yeah, seriously. Can someone please steal these ideas and make them? I don't have enough time to do all this stuff. I guess that's why people start funds and companies and hmm. Maybe I should do something like that. I don't know. So I'll set up the lofter back to you. What, like in the middle of winter, what are you building or what do you want to talk about that you're building that keeps you busy? Yeah, no, I've been in a head sound study mode, really, more than anything. Just pure learning because I have a lot of vague ideas for what, what could be built, but I don't really like to pursue something unless I'm like 98% sure that A, it's a really good idea. B, it will potentially be profitable and sustainable as a thing. Um, C, it wouldn't be like overly complex, like it has to meet some maximum level of complexity. And D, it's suited to my skill set. Uh, and I guess E, it has to be new. Like I don't really like to do things that have been done before. Or if I do, it's got to be a lot better in some key way. So I guess like, for example, Fairspot was a hosting service which should have been done before, but like we, we radically changed the percentage, which kind of changes the whole game and changes all the incentives for the host. And then we decided we're going to give away all the hotspots when people posted for long enough. So like th th that uniquely suited my skill set because it was like a lot of Web2 technologies plus some Web3, front end, back end, like full stack development. I just was able to do the whole thing myself. That's why I pursued that. But as of now, I'm really trying to think about if I'm going to do another thing, the time and energy is precious. And what can I do that's like super high impact? I know we'll have, it will be very consequential. So I've been studying a lot in the Solana ecosystem, really trying to understand what all the projects are there. Not that I didn't know this already. Like I've been involved in, in Solana almost as long as I've been involved in Helium. So basically since the beginning of mainnet, but just really heads down, figuring out like, how do you actually write a smart contract in Solana? What does that look like? What are the pitfalls? What are the constraints? Trying to get the whole design space into my head so I can imagine what is the next era of how we compose applications between Helium and Solana. And I think that it's truly underappreciated, like the level of flexibility we're about to gain from this transition. But I think the things that are, the things that are possible are quite truly insane. And I think... I would almost go so far as to say that like, it won't be necessarily mainly macro market stuff, but it might be just like the types of applications that are enabled that drive the next Helium ecosystem bull run. So I'll throw out an example, and I've got tons of these, but here's a specific one. Think of a company like Fairspot. What do we actually do? Mostly what we do is like physical operations, logistics, shipping, and support. That is 98% of what the actual business is day to day. What came before that, mostly in the beginning, right, was just writing a crap ton of code to automate most things. But like most things just are automated. For example, payment calculations, pay, like paying hosts takes 30 minutes every week, right? That's all mostly automated. All that needs to be done is just 
confirming the transactions, verifying that all the amounts are correct and stuff like that. Even applications, reviewing applications, super easy, super streamlined, preparing and shipping hotspots, super easy, super streamlined, click a button, slap the shipping label on, put it in a bubble mailer and take it to the UPS store or whatever. These are all very streamlined. But at the same time, like all that stuff that's being done, so preparing the hotspots, shipping them and doing support are like the least valuable in an empirical sense, parts of the business. The most valuable part of the business is that someone can essentially prove to us that they have a valuable location via submitting evidence, right? So we have an application form where people can submit, hey, this is who I am, this is my location, here it is on the map, here are five photos of my location, and here's like the place where I'd put the hotspot, here's a view from the hotspot's window, or here's the antenna I'm gonna put on my roof. And hear a few words about me, and then we can review them based on that. And then the only other thing they need to do is pass KYC, which is really key. So that's like the most valuable thing, right? Is that someone can basically come to us, no money, right? Nothing except for a little bit of time spent on their end and say, hey, I have a great location that will expand the network and I'm going to put a lot of effort in. And we can weed out all the people who are low effort, who are in like the middle of the city, and we can say... Oh, wow, like this person right on the edge of coverage, fourth story in an apartment building, amazing. This person, like almost in the middle of the nowhere, but they have a 40 foot tower in their backyard and they can put an antenna on it. They already know what a rack antenna is and they're already gonna buy one if we send them the hotspot, right? So really what it is, it's the mechanism, it's the matching between a host who may not have money or maybe just isn't convinced enough to send the money and us who really wants to help expand the network, but also wants to earn, right? So we get to pick the best spots. And the host, like it's a, just a mutually beneficial thing. The host gets to keep the majority of the earnings. They get to get involved in Helium. And who benefits the most? The Helium network, because we're very picky about picking spots that will expand the coverage the most. We don't build in the middle of the city. We don't build in the middle of nowhere. We just build in the most advantageous locations. And it's a net benefit to the network, because I think what we try to do is net add the most population covered. Like we're pretty mission driven in that way. And so that's like the most valuable thing that we do. And everything else is just, you have to do it in order to serve that goal. And so when you start to think about like how to expand this business, it's very difficult because it's very operations intensive. And it's also not very sexy either. Expanding the operations, first of all, it becomes like exponentially more expensive right? To hire more people, get more locations for like storage and whatnot, and just get more technical expertise in-house for repairing hotspots and diagnosing issues, getting more support staff. Like those are things that don't scale very well. Ideally, those things you want to, you want to keep volume small and keep it to a small team. And so like, this is what all of that explanation was getting to. How do we enable the most valuable parts of Fairspot in this new world, right? On Solana, without having to scale the most manual parts? How do we enable the scaling of the most important parts while leaving the manual stuff to basically the people who can best do it? So on Solana, what we could do is essentially build a decentralized version of something like Fairspot. They would be kind of a one-stop shop place where you can have certain guarantees that make the whole thing much more buttery smooth, right? First and foremost, you don't have to custody the funds as the provider, right? So at Fairspot, like we own all the hotspots, all the earnings come into our wallets and we disperse the funds. But that creates a lot of issues, including tax issues, right? We don't want to be custodying those funds. It's a liability. So it's just not great overall. On Solana, boom, easily solved by a smart contract where we can split the earnings directly from the hotspot between the company and the host. So that's one thing that, that just, that's a problem that goes away entirely. So with that as the basis, you can essentially create a marketplace for matching hosts with people who have inventory. And you can also create a marketplace for people who are great at picking locations to be matched with investors who want to invest in the network. So you guys might have seen Helium Deploy.io. I believe that they're doing this thing. I think it's .io. They're doing a thing where essentially you can invest. If you're out of the USA, you can invest in Helium 5G by putting up money and then they'll deploy 5G locations and you get 80% of the revenue or something. And they're doing this in a very manual way. They're buying a crap ton of inventory and, and doling it out, right? What you ideally want is like a marketplace where hosts can come and apply and they can submit their applications to any number of like 
either investors or like investors who are partnered with people who have proven themselves to have great scrutiny in selecting locations and essentially create like a free market where the host can apply to as many different like potential investors as possible who can offer different splits to the host. And then the investors have a large, the largest pool possible of hosts to select from like great hosts. And also all of the financial parts of it, like the risk heavy parts are guaranteed on chain. So for example, the host might have to sacrifice all their earnings until the hotspot is paid back, especially if they're unsecured, right? So if it's a host that comes without any money up front, but they like have this great location, there could be a marketplace where it's ensured that if the hotspot is shipped out to that place, that the investor can get paid back in a reasonable amount of time. And also that the host doesn't get screwed over by the company who is sending them the hotspot. This is all enforced in a smart contract, essentially. And then you can also have the manufacturers in a bidding war to essentially send out the hotspots to the hosts and also support them. And those are like, what I just said is like, those are all the manual, the most manual bits that will each be doled out to their own party who is most apt at doing each respective role, right? So investors, uh, people who basically audit locations, hosts, and manufacturers can all have their own separate roles in this big decentralized thing where it's a basically like a decentralized version of FairSpot with more flexible parameters and more guarantees about what can actually happen. And then you essentially create a supply demand marketplace around just the existence of new hotspots, the deployment of new hotspots. So I don't know if that was just like an insane rambling or if it made any sense, but yeah. So it, it makes me think of an inter interesting question about related to the smart contract stuff is like, what if token, if token price, like the average mining price, like the earnings per hotspot drops below the cost of electricity? And then what would that need, necessitate on a smart contract level for a post Solana move? I think if you're at the point where mining has dropped below the cost of electricity, that might be already like too far gone. I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. I think we're definitely like probably 10 to 20 X above that level. But yeah, I don't know if smart contracts can fix a situation that dire. Like you can't get around the inherent economics of helium. It needs to be profitable to mine on some level. I think the main variable we look at is how long does it take to get a payback? On 5G right now with an outdoor radio, you can still get payback in like two to three months, which is amazing. On IoT, I don't know. I think probably in the best case, I actually haven't looked at the numbers, so I'm not even going to say, but it's going to be months, right? Minimum of months, unless you're buying a used hotspot for hundred bucks, which is what I was getting at earlier. But yeah, I think this smart contract stuff that I'm talking about is more about making investment in deploying new hardware more seamless and more accessible and less about being able to get around the inherent constraints in the system, which I don't think is possible. Sure, I threw out an idea, like it's playing a game, I, what if game, what if it really goes low, like really low, and then necessitates that. I'm like, well, you could just write a smart contract to just basically redeploy those hotspots. Hot like somebody could step in and be like, yeah, I'll pay for everybody to do that logistical thing. I'll pay you owner of this hotspot that's not earning anything anymore to to ship that to another place and I'll give you 20 bucks or whatever it might be. And then you could have all that codified in the smart contract to, to ship it. And then you're still growing the network. I think that'd be a super idea for a grant to support some development. Again, all these ideas of, I can't do this myself, but that would be an insanely awesome thing to, to take forward and see in the ecosystem. And I know that there might even be some software alternatives that, that could, could take that on as just something they're really interested in. Yeah, definitely. Let's go down that path for a minute that you, that you just brought up. So right now we have a problem where if you buy a hotspot on eBay, you can't really trust that the person is going to transfer it to you. Like you could do it ahead of time. I don't know how that works. How can you prove that it was like the hotspot they transferred is the one that they're actually shipping and not like some dead one, right? So buying a hotspot right now is like this weird gray area where it's hard to get full certainty around if you're going to get what you paid for. And if it's going to arrive in good condition and whatever. And yes, to your point, like on Solana, we're going to be able to add smart contracts and prove certain things on chain, right? You could do a 
basically a, an on-chain escrow transaction where one person is selling a hotspot for a hundred bucks, another person wants to buy it. And the person who wants to buy it puts their location where they want to deploy it on chain. And then once the hotspot arrives and is proven to be like at that location and witnessing other hotspots, right? And that it, um, the hundred dollars can be released to the seller. I don't even know if that's the best way to do it, like logistically, but my point is just that, that generally things like that are possible where you can prove that something happened. You can prove that a hotspot is or isn't online in a certain location. You can prove that it has or hasn't been online in a certain number of days. And you could trigger things like automatically transferring the owner. And you can also do things like having the person who owns the hotspot, like in an equity sense, right? The person who paid for it be the person who controls the split of where the earnings go. But you could also have a different person who's the host be able to control things like asserting the location and updating the antenna info. And you can also create constraints around those things if you're the person who bought the hotspot so that, you know, maybe you want to allow them to move the hotspot within a five mile radius, but you generally want it to be in the town that they signed up for, for example. Because you always want to be able to account for situations like they, you thought a location would be great, the host thought it would be great, but then something happened, maybe the internet wasn't good enough or whatever, they need to move it and have another location, right? There's a lot of edge cases here. But all those things can be accounted for and enabled in a much smoother, more frictionless way than exists now. And I think that's going to allow, as you're saying, Ed, like a much more faithful redistribution of hotspots from areas that are really oversaturated to new areas that still need coverage. I had some tools I was playing with where I could essentially generate an estimated number of population covered by existing hotspots based on how frequently they recently beaconed or whatever. I think I need to whip out that data again. It's like a lot of big data analytics that it's actually difficult to set up. But I had at one point, like a year and a half ago, made a graph of like population covered over time based on that. And that was quite fun. So I'm going to have to try that again and try to answer the question. While there may be like the same or a lower amount of hotspots online than there were, let's say six months ago, are we actually covering more population because there's more redistribution happening? I think that's a really insanely cool question to try to answer. And I think if the answer is yes, like this is something that we can put out there in the world as a KPI and say, hey, look, yeah, the network might be shrinking in numbers, but like actually a lot of those numbers were just redundant and we're actually growing into new areas <laughs> while all of this uh, shrinkage is happening. That's awesome. I, and I love the implications even with the 5G side as well, as if there's not good locations or if their bandwidth isn't up to par and they can't change that, then... There you go. I was also thinking about what if it goes even lower still or something like that. And like, I was thinking back to a thing that Amir had posted a while back talking about a, the Wi-Fi DABA project. And there were some interesting implications there. I don't know if you got a chance to look at that at all. I don't know if I'm familiar with the exact content that you're referring to, but if you could provide like a slight summary that'd be awesome oh gosh i'd have to track down the link but or just like the top basically points. like apps like a, a router with a capacity and ram to do extra things like run apps like daps type of idea okay so you're referring to the wi-fi data video that was released i know what you're talking about now they actually did a video where they demoed this it's pretty cool although i'm quite skeptical on some other level like number one i think they might be trying to do too much which is always something I worry about. Like Helium has been extremely focused on the hardware doing one thing, and even that is an immense challenge. App ecosystems need to have large network effects to be worthwhile, I think. And so you, with that device, you might just end up with something that's like the worst version of everything. And that's not something you really want. On the other hand, I do see the need for lots of different decentralized blockchain nodes to exist. Although like, yeah, then again, a counter to that is the idea that you might hit every single type of interesting node like you might hit the hardware requirements for all of them and be able to run them all in one box with reasonable security guarantees is also very questionable. So I don't know. I'm skeptical of that. I think that I don't know if they're trying to do that as a move to take things to the next level just because either they can or because they're out of ideas. But I always try to give a little bit of benefit of the doubt that someone who's doing something that audacious sees something that I don't see. I would say skeptical of that being a good idea, but I'd love to be surprised. And by the way, I'd love for anyone else to come up if you want to chat. This is supposed to be like a community discussion 
I definitely want to hear your questions, your worries, or your obviously positive things too. I see Grizzle King popped in. I don't know if he'll be able to, to chime in, but I would love an after action report about all the things that were happening over in Europe. I know that he's probably writing up a lot of stuff and will do a lot of videos and stuff. And I saw a lot online already, but it would be great just to hear that vibe and like how much energy is still out there of people who have not even heard of helium so far i think that would be amazing and if you can't talk then definitely we could just speak to what we saw yeah i would love to get gristle king up here and oh yeah you were just requested i'll invite him up also hello Corey. welcome hello Corey is one of our team members at fair spot for those of you who have not interacted with him nice to meet you all i have a quick question i'll go first there's been some uptick in actual network usage could you talk a little bit about that and then maybe what's on the horizon in terms of like IoT devices? Yeah, definitely. I think I'll punt that second one off to Gristle King because that's actually a really good segue and I, into, I think, the question of how's Gristle King's world tour been, which I want to know more about. He's been very much like on the ground talking to people. So I think that's going to be a very good pulse on that specific subject. But as far as the network usage spike, I did look into it when I first saw it. And it does seem to be some sort of like software defined arbitrage of data credits or something. Definitely not any spike in real usage on the network. And it's one of those things where while it's not inherently a problem, it's also not like random spontaneous good news of the usage 10x and overnight or anything like that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. It's not exactly what we hoped, but I know I was super excited when I saw it too. I'm like, oh my God, 5G data credits, but... No, it's best not to get excited before things are actually announced. I can talk about the usage a little bit if you guys oh, yeah, like. Please. It's useful. Yeah. Let's see. Just spent, I don't know, 18 days cruising around Europe on this Helium in the Wild tour. I spent time in, in Lisbon for Solana Breakpoint and up in London, did the Here Be Dragons mapping thing, and then over to Paris and met up with a bunch of fairly enthusiastic students who were in the fintech world, but were curious about Helium and then finished up at the Smart Cities Expo in Barcelona, kind of watching all of these, I don't know, it must have been a couple hundred, if not a few thousand companies there, just figuring out how to make a city smart. And uh, yeah, putting boots on the ground and on behalf of the Helium Foundation who made the whole thing happen. So that was, that's the big overview. I think some of the, there goes the dog with a squeaky toy as soon as I start talking. Let's see, takeaways. So Number one is that at Solana, I didn't meet a ton of people who knew what Helium was or who were developing on Helium. I thought I was going to meet a bunch of people doing that, but I didn't. And so that was the first curious thing. A lot of folks maybe halfway heard of it or would politely nod their heads, but definitely not a people who are like, oh yeah, I'm totally doing this and that and the other. And that was the first interesting thing. So it's just, we're still super early. It's still super new. It's totally f I did meet one guy on the hackathon train on the last day who is a Solana dev, and he was psyched to work on the Here Be Dragons mapping thing, which is taking basically a helium mapper and then making a game out of mapping various points. So the general idea is that you would take uh, points in your town, and this would be a, a fun way to do a helium meetup. It, it's not a business kind of yet, but you take a bunch of points in your town. So in San Diego, get on the Coronado Bridge and then go out to Mission Gorge or go to Balboa Park or, or wherever it is. And then you'd have people do that and see who could do the course the fastest or who could get, let's say there's a couple of places in your town where you want to see where coverage hasn't been done. So you'd set a point in that res eight or res nine hex and just make a fun game out of doing it and give people two or three hours to do it. And that's what we did in London. And the Solana dev on the train was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I'd love to help out with doing it. The big kind of obstacle to that game becoming a business is the same thing that's been an obstacle of just cheating and or stopping cheating in general. Is that as soon as you put money on anything, some asshole is going to come along and yeah, try to make it unfairly so for right now the easiest way to run that is just to not put any money into it and have people do it for fun it was really cool to see on the train that some people have been in Lorawan for a long time and are super savvy with it and even then it's still not the easiest thing to get a device onto the network and to provision it and make sure it's working and get the data flowing through and then do something with that data all those things are still pretty difficult i gave a short speech i think at the end of that and the way i put it was basically work at the internet but pre-hotmail so all this stuff works if you're a geek if you can figure out how to get it work working and it'll work pretty well but it's not ready for the masses it's not like uh, everybody has access to this or, or it's super easy to use and so 
that's a perspective to to keep in mind when we look at like why isn't there more data flowing on the network or why isn't this thing bigger why aren't there more businesses same kind of thing like where was gmail before hotmail it wasn't there yahoo mail may or may not have been there all the rest of those things so i think that's a useful kind of way of looking at it so lisbon and then up in london i think we had 30 or maybe 40 people i don't think we had a total formula like 38 or something show up to talk about how to use helium for business and i think the one of the distinctions on this whole thing was that a lot of people have heard of LoRaWAN, especially in the, the telecoms engineers. All of them knew what that knew all about it. Not everybody knows about helium. And I think I'm trying to think who said this, but that's totally okay. That's to be expected, right? There's tons of private networks that none of us know about that exist and are being used. It's fine if not everybody knows about helium yet, as long as they know about the techno the LoRaWAN side, that's fine. But we did see Oh, and let me go back to Lisbon. There was a guy down there, I think Miroslav Marco, Mike is not last name wrong, with Heliotix. He's got 1,200 Helium devices running on the network right now. And he's out of, I want to say, Slovakia. And he's doing a ton of work with Helium. He's super psyched on it. He's got stuff, everything from measuring water going into buildings. And I guess in Europe by maybe 2024, when did that date wrong, every apartment over 500 square meters I think that might be a big one, is going to have to have, what is it like, basically like utility monitoring at least once a month. And so if he's pushing to do that with LoRaWAN, that seems like a pretty clear use case where you're going to get thousands and thousands of units coming online. And maybe it's not 500 meters, maybe it's it's something else. But I think that was cool to see on the Euro side, they're pushing hard into that and doing it. There was another guy there who's a big telecoms guy cruising around the northern Mediterranean. And he's now pushing down into West Africa and is going to cover Sierra Leone. I think it's like 5 million people with 28 hotspots. So really cool to see. Definitely more professionals. These weren't like uh, folks like me who are not technologically savvy. Um, they're definitely tech savvy folks, but they're building businesses on Helium when they understand the problems and where it is in the ecosystem. But yeah, they get it and they're going for it. And those guys are just like, dude, this is so crazy to have access to this thing. People don't know what they have yet. And they're taking advantage of that kind of general ignorance and going for it and building their business as fast as they can. Let's see, skipping back to London, we had this guy, Bill Clee from Novacine come down. He's been doing LoRaWAN for something like 10 years. And he talked about how he built up his business doing BMS, which is building management systems. Gave a, a pretty cool speech at the end of the day there and just saying, look, there's, I forget how much... You know, everyone's throwing out numbers about how many devices are going to be online, whether it's a billion or a trillion or you know, some crazy amount, whatever it is. And he said, look, there's an awful lot of money in this market to to deploy sensors and give people a better objective of what's going on in their world, whether their world is a building or a city or a neighborhood or a house. And so that was super cool. Let's see. We had a panel with Linkstock coming on and talking about kind of some of the stuff that they're doing that's coming up. They've got some really cool stuff coming down the pipe. Sky from Rack came on and talked about what they're doing kind of sensor-wise. Just a lot of energy about people like, hey, what this is what's coming down the pipe in the next six months to a year. Definitely, as far as I could tell, there's nothing coming in the next week or next two weeks and probably not by Christmas. But in the next year, I think we're going to see some pretty big strides. Adrian from Helium Foundation Waveform was there, talked a little bit about what the foundation is supporting and pushing into. Neil, BFG Neil, gave a talk on TrackPack and what they're doing and how they're growing with Brompton and just kind of how they've gotten big so far or how they've grown so far. Dave at Helium Analytics came on and talked about using data for building a Helium business. So just lots and lots of folks saying, hey, I understand that this is not a fully developed, fully formed, mature network yet but it's going to be. And when it's when it comes online, it lights up for the world, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be riding that wave. And I think that's a good general perspective to have. Let's see. The Paris thing was interesting just because you see kids who are, I think we had four, four students, maybe three. And then another YouTuber, uh, Smokelum, came in and we just talked about Helium. And these were guys who are into DeFi, more finance backgrounds, and just saying, what is this thing? We're trying to decide if we want to get into it. And just seeing that kind of interest was pretty cool. It wasn't like diehard Lorwan people. It wasn't diehard crypto folks. It was folks who were just like, hey, there's something new here. Let's check this out. I think that was pretty heartening to see their, like I said, students at a local college. I think they wanted me to come talk that next day. We didn't have enough time to figure it out for their class. And then from there, went down to Barcelona. And that was, that was amazing to walk around that hall of the smart city stuff and see people doing, people counting lots and lots of air quality sensor stuff, lots and lots of traffic management, whether that was cars in parking lots or going into parking lots or out of parking lots or parked or whatever it was, man, cities managing that stuff. Tons of drone stuff. There was a, an amazing display on the city of Medina in Saudi Arabia. And those guys were just 
they're like, hey, there's some crazy amount of people come in and out of that place to pray every day. It's something like 150,000 people five times a day go in and out of that area to do their meditations and prayer and the rest of it. And he said, look, you cannot do that with just people. You have to have technology. You have to have crowd control. And we do that five times a day with usually four or five times the amount that's going on at a rock concert. And so they're using all kinds of IoT stuff for there. They, I don't think they're a great candidate for helium for a variety of reasons, but just seeing kind of the amount and quality and quantity of what's going on in that world of IoT and then how much of it is appropriate for helium, pretty cool. I think the last thing, and then I'll shut up for a bit, was just seeing some young kids who had this kind of cool idea. It was like a almost a wooden tent. It was a structure that you could set up at any wild place in the world and it had a shower and a little washing thing and Wi-Fi and place to do laundry and the rest of it. And you could basically set this thing up and have a campsite anywhere. And their biggest concern was like, how do we monitor how much water is left in the tank or how much shit is in the shitter or whatever? And that's, I think they're in Corsica. And so when I talk to them about helium, they're like, dude, this sounds awesome. Let's see if we can put a sensor pack into our little outdoor building and see if that works. So I think maybe that is not the biggest business anyone's ever heard of, but it's a pretty cool business. And it's just, to me, it was proving out the idea that, hey, helium's time is as far as use has not yet come, but we are getting there. That was in general the trip. I got a bunch more to write out, but I think that's the that's it at Broad Strokes. Nick, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that was a lot of really positive news for a lot of us in here. And you're really turning this into the uh, therapy session we needed. Right on. It's exciting to, to have boots on the ground and to be talking to people and to see how many people are coming up and saying, here's what I'm doing or what can I do or how can I do it? And I see that there is certainly a, at the very least, and I think it, this is just the tiniest part of it, there's a business in helping people start IoT businesses. So I think what we're going to see is a lot of the folks who were doing hotspot management and hotspot sales and the rest of it, whether that's Helium Deploy or Parley Labs or you guys at Fairspot or whatever, are going to start to say, okay, people needed help with this kind of technology before. Now they're going to need help with sensor technology and understanding how to build that into a business and how to see all that data and visualize that and then ultimately make decisions off of that. That's where we're going to see enormous growth. The constant message was like, hey, don't worry about Solana right now. Don't worry about the token price. Don't worry about the general bear market. Don't worry about building right now. Well, everyone else is freaking out. Like, Get your head down and build and you'll be way ahead of the curve for the summer of 2023. Yeah, exactly. Because no matter what's going on in the back end or with the price, it doesn't make data packets flow or not flow, right? The network is there, it works. And people who are starting businesses today are the ones who are going to be huge once the next cycle rolls around. A lot of people underestimate how much time it just takes to build a solid foundation to be even able to take advantage of the type of growth that is offered by the crypto industry. I mean, imagine getting something even twice as big as the previous wave of helium growth. That's just going to be overwhelming for any company that has any semblance of demand for their product, especially if they're building hardware. Yeah. Yeah, no, the amount of use cases that are out there for just for IoT is incredible. And I think it's it's really across this whole blockchain and meat space. We got Mike Horton on here who runs the GeoNet project. And that's another thing that kind of lower win is I, I think they call it deep tech. It's like the tech that none of us really know about, but everybody uses. And so what they're doing is the GNSS stuff, centimeter accuracy. We're seeing across the board that this tech is bubbling up and into everybody's lives. And the decentralized part is making it so that everybody can step in and get their piece of the pie and, and participate at whatever level they want. If you just want to run a hotspot, on your house, that's cool. The earnings will never be what they were, but you can still participate in the network. If you want to build something for yourself or your property or your building or your rental property or whatever, you can do that. If you want to build a business offering that service to other people, you can do that. What this movement is doing is allowing more access points for anyone in the community to enter in and start and participate in it. And that's, that is super heartening. And so that means that for me, I just don't give a fuck about any of these token prices. It's, there's no time for that shit. It's the time is to kind of learn and build. And that's what we should be doing. Yeah, and I want to commend you for basically spreading that message since the beginning, and especially recently, just really focused in on that, and you haven't deviated one bit from that mission. I think we really need your voice here to continue pushing that message of, look, guys, what are we here to do? Are we here for tokens? Some of us were, and now they're not here, right? <laughs> this space would be a lot bigger if it was six months ago, and all the people who were just in it for tokens were also here trying to get some alpha or whatever. So no, we're here for the actual network. I've been here since before the token was worth anything. And I'm still here. But I want to take the conversation in a couple of directions because I think, Nick, I think you opened the door to a couple of interesting things. And I hope you have a little bit of time to stick around, but let me know if you don't. I think there's two things I want to touch on. First is just taking a step back from all the on the ground stories you just shared and summing them up into sort of a more macro observation. 
And the second thing I want to do is have a more honest talk about what still needs to be improved in the IoT network and where we are. And also for anyone out there who's like in the helium is all about 5G camp, I want to stress that I think we're mostly going to be talking about IoT today. So that's, it's definitely not all about 5G, folks. It's IoT is still here and is still the dominant network as of this moment. So first of all, I just want to summarize everything that you just said, Nick. And a meta observation, you said this at the beginning of your little monologue there is where we are on the curve of adoption is very reminiscent of not even early cell phone days, but almost like car phone days, where obviously landline telephony has been around for a long time and has been very useful since the beginning and became widely adopted. But like the first people using mobile phones were not obviously your average people. There wasn't even that much coverage. It was just the people who gained the absolute most from it, the people who really had some sort of massive cost or time savings. So for example, people who are running businesses who had to be at all sorts of meetings left and right, and like the more meetings they could take per day, the more successful they could be, those people would pay tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to have car phones that connected to the very few towers that were around there, or they would carry around this huge briefcase size thing. And to 99.99% of people that either seemed ludicrous or just, I guess, cushy or just not necessary, didn't relate to their daily lives. And it didn't need to, it, w it wasn't for them yet. And those were the early users that led us to where we are now with ubiquitous wireless technology. But after the car phones was like, even then tens or hundreds of thousands of subscribers with these like bulky cell phones, I think we're kind of like maybe in that realm and like tens to hundreds of thousands of subscribers, like that's like the metaphor for where we're at with the Helium IoT network, where the people who are super excited about it right now are the people who are like, as you said, holy shit, we need to track every single utility meter in all of Europe for all these apartments. And like, what are we going to do? This is going to be insanely expensive. And then they learn about Helium and they're like, okay, as long as I can get one packet per month through the network, this thing is going to be remarkably a better cost profile and remarkably easier to deploy and just higher reliability than literally anything else out there. It'll probably reduce our labor and expenditure by 10 to 100x. This is incredible. We're going to build out everything on this for as long as we can, or for as reasonably large of a footprint as we can based on the coverage. And there are also the people who are just have some really insane niche that the Helium IoT network enables. And you also brought up a couple of those. So that's where I feel like we're at. We're definitely not at the point where you could just, I think I've brought up this example before, but go to 7-Eleven and buy some useful little device, like a little tracker that, that runs on Helium and you just don't even think about setting it up. It's just, oh, I'm going on a backpacking trip this weekend. Like I'm going to grab a few trackers for like my water bottle, my uh, backpack and my keys. Just so, you know, I haven't put trackers on them in a while. So I'm just going to pop into 7-Eleven, spend five bucks, grab a few trackers. Yeah, that like that, we're not at that level yet, <laughs> but that's where we can be one day, I think. So uh, Nick, I'm interested in your thoughts about what I just said. Yeah, I think all of that is is right. I think there's, I mean, there's some really interesting stuff about the 5G versus IoT piece. I think, you know, I look at this and it's not like one versus the other. The, what Nova and Helium Foundation is looking at is like, how do we win this whole kind of telecom, telecom wireless industry thing? And they're making a bunch of bets. And it seems like the 5G stuff is really interesting in the US, but outside the US, IoT is what they've gotten. It's what they're going with. And I mean, man, it was like everything from Lynx Cat, the wild cat, where we don't think about this. So there's a this Slovakian company who's tracking these links. And I think they're tracking them between France and Spain. And so people of those who don't track wild animals don't think that if you put a, an LTE of a cell phone on an animal, like if it goes from one country to the next and it's got to switch coverage, you go from the U.S. to Mexico, you need a whole different phone plan. But with Laura, with Helium, you don't. You could travel all throughout Europe and you're totally fine. And just the things that it opens up in ways that are not maybe appropriate for everyone yet or useful for everyone yet, but is what's coming is... It's just this kind of endless stream of, holy smokes, that works too. And that's interesting too. And it's not perfect. LoRaWAN isn't for everything. You can't stream video on it. But the amount of things that it is good for and the amount of kind of information and data flow that it will unlock is like an indicative of the eventual value it'll generate. So yeah, we're not, we're not at the 7-Eleven point yet. That's a great example. But I think we're going to be there sooner than maybe we think. Yeah, I think we can be. And I think what it's going to take to get there is to just be honest as well and critical about the things about the network that still need to be improved. And so, you know, I, I'm like a deeply technical observer of the network. I'm not necessarily on the ground hearing people's individual use cases or anything, but I do understand what parts of the network are working and are not. And 
I also feel like kind of like with early cell phone technology, when it was really unreliable, we're still kind of there with the IoT network. And I view Helium's IoT evolution in three stages, and we're on the cusp of stage three. So stage one was when it was essentially a proprietary protocol that was not related to LoRaWAN really in any way. It was it was called LongFi, and it wasn't compatible with any of the LoRaWAN protocol or any of the devices out there. Like it was kind of an insane idea of let's build this entirely new standard that's like more perfectly suited to the these devices, right? The hotspots that can do a little bit of extra stuff above what LoRaWAN can do. But I think the team quickly found out that like you can't just build a brand new standard like that. You're going to have to spin up hardware supply chains and you don't have the familiarity of an, a whole ecosystem of people who are familiar with the software. I think they realized that that was just a no-go and they sacrificed some functionality to switch the whole network to LoRaWAN. This is like 2019 we're talking about, maybe early 2020. Once the switch to LoRaWAN happened, the amount of usage, uh, potential users on the network shot up by basically infinity percent. Whereas before, when it was just LongFi, there was almost no chance of getting any sizable users. It just wasn't, it just wasn't going to happen. And then after transitioning to LoRaWAN, then it was suddenly possible to access this broad ecosystem of device makers and companies looking to deploy and consultants who are familiar with the technologies and sources of hardware manufacturing and funding, like just basically opened up all the possibilities. So that's stage two. Stage three is just making the network work as advertised, I think. And stage two, I think the problem with stage two is they fixed the protocol, but the blockchain side of things was just not there yet. And the software stack was not mature yet. And so we're, we're still in that. So like data transfer accounting has never been good enough. I can't speak much to the actual reliability of getting packets through hotspots, although I know that's been subpar too, but like the um, accounting of actual usage on chain has been... It's not scaled, essentially. It has not been able to scale. And that has caused a lot of issues, especially with like multi-packet delivery. Like I see it in my own experiments when I'm playing with things. You can't necessarily get a packet through all the hotspots in your area ever. <laughs> it's just not really possible. And I think that's not even just the blockchain, but like the Helium console and router just can't scale to the, the next level of growth that we need. And so that's why you see this, I think what was very surprising to some people complete upheaval once again of this time, not the protocol LoRaWAN, but like the back end of the tech stack where, you know, this Helium console, which has been under development for two to three years, suddenly we're just throwing that all out. We're just going to use totally industry standard LoRaWAN stuff. And we're going to re completely redo the packet transfer and data accounting and make it much more scalable, make it much more sort of web two, to be honest, not relying as much on the chain for things using web two like horizontal scalability to like make sure that these packets can actually get through at a reliable scale and so that's what we're looking at right now i know there hasn't been necessarily a lot of news coming out but this whole new architecture with oracles is essentially going to replace all the data transfer plumbing that exists right now and it's going to unlock an entirely new level of scalability for data transfer and really important usability use cases like class c and for people who don't know, LoRaWAN Class C is basically, it enables a LoRaWAN device. Okay, so for those who don't know, like devices on the Helium network today, they can't really receive data unless they send it first, right? So let's say you, you want to make like a smart light switch with Helium. And let's just say the light switch itself is connected via Wi-Fi, but the light bulb is connected via LoRaWAN, right? So you want to be able to screw in a light bulb anywhere and have this light switch work with it, right? So that light bulb, in order to work in today's Helium network, essentially has to send a ping every like three to five seconds and ask, hey, has anyone changed the switch status? And that gets really expensive. It's really inefficient, just not ideal. Class C sort of enables a downstream connection without an upstream, without an uplink first. So the light bulb can just sit there and listen. Someone can flip the switch and it can send a message out from a hotspot and it can hit that light bulb and it can turn on. So that's like a use case that isn't even possible in the current architecture, but will be in the new architecture. And so I think these things that we need to talk about them and be honest about them, that like the state of the network in terms of actual functionality, and they work, it works enough for a lot of projects to start building. It works enough for a lot of projects to do proof of concepts and to reach like a small to medium scale, like a thousand or 10,000 devices maybe. But it's not at the point where it can reach a hundred thousand or a million or 10 million or a hundred million. And there are 
projects out there that could reach that scale, like individual projects that could reach the scale of 100 million LoRaWAN devices quite readily. Now we need to enter this sort of stage three, and I know there's not a lot of celebration or fanfare or excitement happening right now, but if you look on GitHub, if you're a technical person, you can go look and see all the work being done. And I think it's going to be a absolute phase shift for what is possible on the network and the amount of growth that can be handled. And I think it's incredibly positive or bullish, as some like to say, that we've reached the point where the problem is that the amount of scalability that's needed for people who want to use the network is the problem that needs to be solved. That is incredibly positive. And that's like the problem you want to have. Yeah, totally. So I think these are like, uh, what do they call them? High quality problems. As long as Helium keeps having high quality problems, then that's great news. Like, it's not great news to always have problems, but as long as they're high quality, that's better than nothing. And that's the first big piece. Yeah, totally on board with all that. All right, got a request. Yeah, let me invite Gary up to the stage here. Yeah, I just wanted to say a few things. On the perception of the network, I think it's actually worse than early because there's we have a lot of baggage. There's a lot of history that people have experienced of it, and but they've been burned in one way or another, either through the token or through hardware. But also in Australia, you guys may not be aware, we had a whole drama about frequency change for a reason that none of us really understood. And it happened yesterday and um, I had to go out and uh, install a gateway, a non-helium gateway to pick up because our sensors were never capable of the new frequencies. So there's that. I don't really want to discuss that. What I want to put forward, though, in terms of issues that need to be solved is the, just the onboarding process. Right now, like as soon as they changed it so you could only have 10 devices, on the standard console, things really went awry. And at the moment, your best option is actually to email sales at Nova and there's no, no sort of upfront data about what you're getting into. But what you end up with is the same situation you used to get immediately for free by default. The, all the other options were like they're much more expensive or they're in beta or whatever. So the upfront experience is just not good for anyone who's genuinely wanting to use the network. And I am. We've got 20, 22 devices on it that we did, and then we had to rip out about 20 of them. And then we've got another, I think it's about 10, 12, that I'm about to onboard of a different kind. Yep. I think this is a really important issue that I haven't seen a solid answer on from anyone, either from Nova or Foundation as well, which is after we rip up the heal. Okay. So let, let me back up for a second. You're talking about the present situation where for the past two years or so, anyone has been able to go to console.helium.com, sign up as many, add as many LoRa devices as they want and essentially pay per usage. There were some there were some starter credits, right, to get people started, but I think those were being abused, so they took those away, which whatever, that's fine. But now, as of I don't know how long it's been, six months a year, maybe six months ago, you a bit less. if you want to have more than when was it? I don't know, June. I think it was June. Okay. Yeah, so around six months ago, if you want to add more than ten devices, you have to contact sales at nova.xyz and basically get on what they call the VIP console. I don't quite also understand what the motivations are behind this. Usually you don't do something like that without a good reason to do it, but I do agree that it definitely harmed the onboarding process for new devices. It's really important, I think, to have a no contact place for people to be able to spin up as many devices that they want, or just like an easy to use onboarding scenario, right? I think that's what you're getting at. What we had was the AWS experience. It used to be like you'd contact sales and you'd do a deal to be able to post. But then AWS made it all transparent, pay-as-you-go pricing. You could end up with a bill of three cents if you would just test. And when that's what we had. But now what we have is much more of an enterprise, blah, blah, blah. You don't really know what you're getting into. You might have to negotiate. and takes you know, It takes a human conversation to get on board. So we've really gone backwards. Yeah, and then also at the same time they casually throw out, oh, you can self-host, which is a which is true, but that's a whole drama. That's not a small thing, and it involves crypto and all sorts of stuff. And at the same time, that's really risky because that's really all going to change very soon. You'd be crazy to start up a hosting hosting for others or hosting for yourselves right now. Yeah, so I guess just to provide the remaining context, where we are now is that we're in a 
situation that's worse off than existed six months ago, where you could essentially have the AWS like experience and spin up as many devices as you want and incur small fees and basically yeah. just go crazy. Yeah, that it's worse now. And where it will go is... I wouldn't say worse, it's probably better because as you're saying, like the self-hosted console is an incredibly heavy beast. You need to run a blockchain node, you need to set up like all sorts of stuff. It's not the easiest thing to spin up. And also who wants to manage that level of infrastructure? I think what we're switching to is a system where you can use something like ChirpStack, which I've heard is remarkably easier to set up, remarkably less resource consumption, a lot more user friendly. But I just don't have any sort of indication of what is the easy on-ramp for people who just hear of Helium and Google set up Helium device and just want to get started and, and have that AWS like experience. Like I don't know where that lives anymore or will live. And, and to your point, like anyone who wants to get started today is in a, a totally awful position of, hey, yeah, you can sign up for what we have now, but it's all going to go away and we're just going to replace it with a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, why can't they just advertise? Why can't they just advertise the VIP console with some terms and conditions and an immediate sign up just to carry us through this topsy turvy period? And then slowly they need to bootstrap a third party market if they're going to, if they actually want to back out of hosting consoles. But then the primary example of this is the third party host is in the European one, which is actually five times the price that we're all used to. Why? And that's Europe only. Like we're not all in Europe or the US. No, I honestly couldn't agree more. This, like my background is in user experience. And I think that there's no doubt a much worse user experience today and an unknown one going forward when it comes to onboarding new devices. And that's definitely, uh, I would say, one of the biggest current pain points I see with the IoT network. It's huge. It's very important. And I would love more clarity around it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it remains to be seen if no one picks up the ball, right? There always could be ecosystem members who are going to come around and create a great experience. I think a lot of the insight behind locking the console behind a sales call maybe was that like a lot of the people who are using the console or the biggest users of the console are actually just like enterprises who need more handholding. And while I don't doubt that a significant portion, probably the majority of the network usage will be from enterprises. I also think that the permissionless nature of the Helium network is being totally like disrespected in, in not having a very easy to use console. Because I do think that one of the biggest sells of the network has always been you don't have to go to, to an AT&T store and get a SIM card. And yeah. suddenly now you kind of do. Uh, mm. And that's not great. And I do think that as there is... By removing the need to go and get to a sales call or get a SIM card or whatever, you open the door for brand new use cases made by some kid in their garage that's going to like become a viral sensation, essentially, or be the next big thing. Th those little small-time tinkerers who want to go past 10 devices right now are just, I don't really want to get on a sales call. Or maybe I'm like 14 years old or like my parents wouldn't let me or maybe I just don't like talking to people. Like there's a million reasons why you wouldn't get on a sales call. And especially for someone who is like an introverted builder, they just want to sit and stay in their garage and keep working on the thing and grow it and maybe even be anonymous, right? This is crypto. I yeah. think that those use cases, those builders are being significantly hampered by the current state of affairs. Obviously, to, like from here, there is only room for improvement, right? Things can pretty much only get better. I think the only oh, way they get worse is if that <laughs> they just shut down console to any sort of sign up entirely. But that it, obviously would make no sense. The only thing that's keeping it going now is that it is the largest global LoRaWAN network in the world, and by far, by like 50 times or, or something. That's the only thing keeping it alive. Yep. And as I said, y'all can go listen to the beginning of the recording of this space, but just bringing up the point again briefly, that helium mining is very sticky, and there's not a lot of cost to upkeep. So a lot of the miners will stay online, even if it's not making them a huge profit or whatever. We haven't seen a lot of miners just straight up turn off. That that's a that bodes well for the layup, right? Coming into the layup to make an awesome onboarding experience for device makers or users of the network. Like yeah, the network's I, not going away. No, but it's meant to be, the whole point of it is meant to be, you could look at it cynically, actually. There's two reasons for it that that people would get involved. One is because they actually want an IT network. That's the poster reason. The other reason is for crypto. They're going to get rich. If the primary reason is to run an IT network for utility, 
then someone needs to be focusing on the customer experience. And because they haven't been, that just adds weight to the other potential reason, which is get rich on crypto. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just laying it all out here because you said you wanted an honest conversation and it's not like we're talking to the media. But I'm just surprised how long it's gone in this situation right now with such a horrible customer experience. And I, I keep thinking, oh, they're going to make an announcement. They're going to make some marketing. There's going to be some public, transparent sort of onboarding experience. But it's been months now and nothing's happened. Yeah, I appreciate the honesty. And this is, these are the conversations we want to get going here. Because I actually think that it's really important for us to put out our worst criticisms in order to understand, just like reach a mutual understanding with the builders who are actually building this stuff about why certain concerns are or are not getting addressed. And, you know, I, I see both sides of this. I see that the customer experience is suffering. And I also see that what is the main goal of Nova Labs and the Helium Foundation right now? Getting the architecture to be just scalable enough to meet the usage needs that already exist. And that is like the Oracle's architecture plus migration to Solana. And that will also help solve the liquidity issues as well. So. I can see why those are the top priorities. I think it's really helpful to remember that this is a small team and maybe they need to get bigger and maybe it's hard to grow. I don't know. Like that, those are not the type of business things that I'm very good at understanding or giving direction on. I mostly just sit back and hope that like people who are good at growing businesses can grow them in the right ways. But it's no doubt that with a project that has gained so much growth and popularity within the last two years there are going to be a lot of people who want different things and a lot of those things are going to be very important and those important things are often going to go unaddressed just because this is not like a fortune 500 size business that can tend to all the things and i think it's just important that we don't hide those things that are glaring holes that need to be filled but rather we talk about them and hopefully maybe there's someone in the audience sitting who who is like either a i am the perfect person to go fix this and i'm going to go apply to labs or to the foundation or they're like b i'm an entrepreneur and it's the bear market and i just want to build shit and it's open source i'm going to go build the best version of an onboarding experience and just market the hell out of it and i'm going to own the market for onboarding people onto helium and i think it's also important to recognize that we're not past the point where this is like a startup that needs community support like that. Like we can't just sit back and let Nova and foundation build everything. If we want to have the best network, we are going to need people to fill the gaps. Yeah. I don't know if that's good news or bad news, but I think it's just honest. But no one's going to take on the onboarding experience from outside helium because helium itself is, is uh, changing everything. So it'd be a massive risk. And then helium itself could come out with a better one because they have control of the platform. So you've got a massive platform risk to get involved in that. I don't think that there's a big problem with risk necessarily, especially if it's just software, right? These hardware manufacturers have taken on the ultimate risk of building hardware for a network that they don't even know if it's going to be around, right? They don't know if no. they're going to be able to continue having sales. And incidentally, a lot no. of them have been. No, that, uh, if you're talking sensor hardware, that's not the case. Sensor hardware is built for LoRaWAN regardless of Helium. Oh, no, they're, not the hotspots, sorry. Oh, the hotspots. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where they're at now. Things have really changed for them. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think most of them are down 98% in sales, and a lot of them are... It's not a surprise that some of them have filed for bankruptcy. I think so far it's only at Synchrobit, which has been kind of MIA for the last year anyway, but certainly a lot of them are not in a good place right now, some, and that's to be expected. There's the opportunity sales now. Going on right now as well. Uh, I know MNTD Minted is is doing some Black Friday type of sales. I think there might be some others in that space that are trying to push out some sales. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of sales go on in crypto winter if they if people are still interested and if they're still biting and building. So this is going to be a good telltale sign, I think, of who's still in this space in a general sense. Who's still wanting to build? Who's excited about it? Who's even talking about it? Who's logging on to Discord? Like all those kinds of things is just because these are our allies. And then figuring out even those secondary allies, I think back to initially when Helium announced that there was like a co-announcement with AkashNet of doing a validator on Akash. And I think that was really cool. So I think we could see some maybe console integrations there. I don't know. But it's interesting what happens and who gets together in these things of still building, still interest, because then that's where your long-term friendships can, and relationships and business partnerships can come from, or even like just co-opting funds together and tackling problems like this. Because you know what 
when, when it all boils down, what is the thing that we need to focus on? And I think that's another thing that echoed through um, Havai's recent assumption of the CEO role at Helium Foundation is what are the things that we need to focus on in the community and lay that out. I think the three main opportunities now are the track pack model where you're straight to the customer and you hide where the network's really coming from or you just don't need to talk about it. And the other one is a solution provider. And another one is the if you're Senate or Actility where you roam onto it. I think that's where the business is now. But the potential is so much bigger than that. And that's where they really need a developer relations person, customer experience person. It's like they're not even there. Yeah, I mean, basically what we want to see is is a better than original Helium console type onboarding where it's just super, super easy. And i to be honest, I don't have a lot of experience with Chirpstack or the other LNSs out there. I don't really know what the onboarding experience looks like. I don't know how to integrate those with like data credits or if they are integrated with data. Like, I don't really even understand how the new flow of getting from a credit card to packets on the network that you paid for works. Not really well, sure. Need- I know that it's going to be much easier on Solana, but I don't know how it works with the new LNS, like self-hosted LNS architecture. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the reason I don't get excited about self-hosted, it's good as a backup and it's good for certain enterprises. But just think of the whole cloud thing. This is where the whole industry has moved towards SaaS, sign up for the cloud with a credit card and you don't have to run servers. No, definitely. I'm not suggesting that self-hosted is a solution. I, I'm trying to think through the thought process of someone who is trying to build that cloud experience for others. Like, okay, okay now I'm hosting a Chirpstack server. Does that have built-in management of organizations and billing? And is that easy to hook in somehow um, with on-chain stuff? Like, how do, is there a module that's going to be built for Chirpstack for that? Or other LNS is good? I don't really when know. I looked at it, when I looked at it, I don't think it does have billing. But it is a stack and you can take pieces. I think you would be able to have the router from Chirp stack and build your own UI on top with it using an API. Okay, so it's like a nice back-end API that you could use to build something. Yeah, I don't know. I'm interested to see. I don't know if we've heard anything from even Nova on whether there will be a replacement to the VIP console that's based on something like Chirp stack. The, to, to your initial criticism... What we're looking at right now is going potentially from this world where we have the free console that's limited to 10 devices, not free, but open console and the VIP console to the world where everything has to be self-hosted and there's no cloud type product at all. And well, if, that's, if that's going to exist, I don't, I have not seen any sort of announcement. The guy, Dal, is on the community call. He's made comments to the effect that they don't want to be hosting console. They want a third party market. But if they just pull uh, Nova console or stop allow stop approving applications, then we're really in the shit. Like it, that, that just can't be the way to go. Yeah, it seems like at the very least, the thing to do would be have a foundation grant to some sort of Web two infrastructure provider, like even like a hosting or VPS company or some cloud business that likes to provide platforms as a service and contract them to essentially run this LNS and do all the credit card billing stuff and the conversion to data credits. Nothing too complicated, but just find mm-hmm. some sort of like turnkey solution that people can use that's a- as easy as console or easier. Isn't that a tip-in case like to run console? I think the problem with console is that it's inferior as, a, as an LNS. Right. So it can't support class C and other things without significant engineering effort when there are already mature stacks that support those things that are really needed by the users. That's Oh, yeah. So the work needs to be done. But what I mean is like once they've got that sorted out, the console stuff sorted out, they should be able to incentivize people with HNT to run console servers around the world. Definitely. And actually... <laughs> I don't know why I've spent so much time thinking about weird stuff like this, but this is how I spend my time, folks. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how can you incentivize people to host essentially consoles or chirp stacks. And I think the real meat there is find a business that is going to be very serious about KYC and about working with real verified businesses. If you can do some like effective fraud prevention and prevent people from abusing free data credits or even just abusing the ability to use your services and overloading them, 
you could do some actual incentivization of the device deployments, right? You could have a subsidy per device deployed, which could be especially effective for devices that send once per hour or whatever. You could you could have investors come in and incentivize fleets of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices, making them free to run for up to a certain period. Let's say it's a certain number of data packets used, or maybe one year free or two years free, or you could even pay, like you could incentivize in the same way that hotspots are incentivized, like right way before the hip 10 days when we were trying to do this with data credits, it was right. We were trying to in incentivize device usage. The problem was that there was just too much fraud. So if someone came in with a solution where they could tackle the fraud problem and only work with verified businesses that are actually building real things, they could actually bring investors in or even maybe even get a grant from the Helium Foundation, just as you're saying, right? Throw HNT at the problem and incentivize those device manufacturers to deploy and sell their products and drive real usage over the network in a way that they're verifying that this is real device usage that are driving real use cases. That is an actual massive opportunity, I think. And now uh, you're paying someone to use something that's meant to be of value to them. Certainly. I'm not saying it's the best way to do it, but I think the point is that it can be done. Even the console initially gave you, what was it, 10,000 data credits or is it a million? I don't know, some amount. So just give, giving some, giving businesses a bucket of free data credits to get started, it's one of those rising tide lifts all boats things. If you can spend $1,000 each on 100 businesses, right, spend $100,000 incentivizing their first $1,000 of usage, and then you just onboarded 100 businesses that are going to continue building on the network, I think you've done a net positive for yourself and for yeah. the network, assuming you're an HNT holder. And this is why I think we need more community solutions to these things, because people can become HNT holders and can like incentivize themselves to align with the network in ways that are positive sum. But I just don't think we have a lot of businesses thinking in that way yet. Yeah, well, the, the Acash model incentivizing people with crypto to run hosting services. So it's very close. We've already had validators. Why can't we have consoles that are HNT incentivized? I think the idea with the oracles is that that you can run those basically on anything. You can do it AWS. You can do it Akash. You can do it on Azure. Whatever you're, you're wanting to do, you can set that up and set it up. I think it's the idea there is like making sure that it's secure, right? That it's trustworthy and that kind of stuff, which is a legit concern when people are trying to manipulate the system and take those opportunities for arbitrage. I think zooming out, there was a question in the chat earlier talking about that, that very thin tracker sensor. And the question was, could someone explain the hindrance of low cost trackers? like that coming online. So we talked about this content problem being like how to route that data securely and get it back to the person who owns that device. But uh, we haven't talked anything about the manufacturability or the getting these sensors online as the question stated. And I was talking with Winston Lazar and he's been in this LoRaWAN space for a long time. And he was telling me that even if you have a good idea today and you're going to, oh, he just popped on. There he is. Maybe he can get up here and talk about it, but because he would do a way better job than me. But he's been primarily focusing on municipalities and how to target helium for them. And it takes at least a year and a half to two years from idea inception to actually get it out and build it out. I don't know if we can invite him. What's up, guys? I have five that. minutes and I jumped Welcome in and you this. happen to be talking about me. I don't know. That's super yeah, spontaneous. Oh my God. What <laughs> Your ears were burning. Get up here. Yeah, so the question earlier was, what's the impediment to getting low, like low-cost trackers or any sensor idea online today from your perspective? Oh, I don't even remember that conversation, <laughs> Ed. I have no idea, but I have worked <laughs> with those nanotags. I've done a lot of stuff with those nanotags, actually. Really cool product. I'm super excited about it. I'm not going to divulge any more than this, but I'm working with a Fortune 100 company on asset tracking with those to like monitor for theft prevention and stuff like that. But yeah, ask away. I don't know what, I'm happy to answer questions in the three minutes that I have. There was a Helium designer employee that was thinking about the end user experience for devices. And I was suggesting a QR code to onboard as quickly as possible. Yes, I love Got the it. idea of codes for onboarding. Yep, anything to make that process a little bit more seamless for people. It's clunky for any of us super easy right now adding stuff and managing in console but yeah that's the way things are going with any sort of device setup right now so that kind of thing just should make it super easy for onboarding and i don't know i think that's part of the issue but 
not the whole of it. I think there's just too many well-known consumer products that solve these problems in other ways. Maybe they don't get the same sort of coverage and benefits that you'd get doing that on LoRaWAN. But yeah, I think that onboarding thing is one part of the problem. Ed, real quick, what's the thing you're working on right now that you're most excited about? And then what's the biggest issue or struggle you're working on? Oh, wow. That's a huge question. What am I working on? I'm going to have to like pause and think about all of that. There's so many things in motion. Wait, sorry. Uh, I, meant I, guess, to, okay. I meant to ask that to Winston since he had one minute left or oh, two yeah, minutes. Let's go but then Winston. Ed, go after. Wait, what's the, que- okay. what's the question? I'm literally in the bathroom like trying try to go take a tea <laughs> before going to dinner. But what's the question? <laughs> okay, you don't have to ask, answer this. But what's the thing you're most excited about that you're working on? And then what's the biggest struggle? Uh... Okay. Most exciting thing is, I don't know if anybody's seen, I have not done any active promotion of this, but working with the city in Shreveport, implementing actually several Web3 technologies, several DY techs, as well as HiveMapper. So in general, that project is super exciting. We're implementing like city-wide DY for CBRS, LoRaWAN, and HiveMappers. Amazing. It's Shreveport, Louisiana, if I didn't mention that before. All right. And then what's your biggest struggle right now? Besides oh the Twitter spaces in the bathroom. <laughs> my biggest struggle. Let's see. It is not easy to do this stuff within the context of the city government. There's just all kinds of extra loop loopholes and things like that are encumbering and trying to get contracts going. So overall, that's it. Also prioritizing. Part of the reason I'm doing this in Shreveport is because it is a bootstrapped or a city with a it's generally very economically challenged. And so that's part of the reason why DY was the answer, because they have a lot of the major carriers trying to implement or at least propose what got our contract started was citywide free Wi-Fi to bridge the digital divide. That's how we got started. And then there's all kinds of things that they want to work on. So it's a super innovative team that's implementing these programs, but they're on a bootstrap budget. And so it's really hard to prioritize not just which technologies we implement, but where they're implemented. Wow. You got my mind spinning about all the things that could be possible with town like that. Definitely like installing Wi-Fi, helium Wi-Fi, once it becomes a thing, could be pretty remarkably efficient for distributing internet access at a very low cost to a lot of people. Yeah, right now we've got CBRS going and people can go into a public library. There's currently four participating branches. They can just walk into the library and check out a CBRS enabled internet router and get free public Wi-Fi. The, the key difference that makes this interesting is they do it from within their homes. So it's not they're just going out in the park, pulling out their laptop and they can only do it in one certain area. They can do it. We've got a coverage map. As long as you fall on that coverage map, your wireless gateway is going to work. And how many users can you share? Oh, we launched it early November. We're, our pilot covers over 1,000, but we've got our budget was just approved to 5x. And hopefully we keep getting more budget as people get onboarded. And the city wow, so is a population of 200,000. So they actually want to allow anybody in the city of 200,000 to do that. All of that being said... One of the other constraints of doing this within a city is that it's political. And guess what? The mayor just got voted out. So I'm a little bit in the dark. There's a runoff. There's two people that are battling for contention in the runoff. We'll see what happens. But we've got some, at least in the current CTO organization, great leadership and great support for what we're doing. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. That's some real. Sure. I told stuff. you, Armand, we need, I reached out a little bit ago. I told you we need to chat. This is what I was thinking about oh, when, when I reached out. Definitely. Now I know we need to chat. Just to, I don't know how much time you have left, but just to clarify real quick. So you're building out CBRS to provide Wi-Fi to people, including in their homes. So is this, are they piggybacking on your CBRS connections as their primary internet connection? Correct. Yep. That's what they're doing. And we're using the library's internet, which affords several benefits including we're using child safe filtered internet that internet is cut it's an e-rate internet so basically it's 10 percent of the cost of the commercial fiber connections that we would get if we were just to go straight to the carrier ourselves so that's pretty cool so you're essentially use and this is all built on helium right i'm really sorry but it's not i can have we can have another conversation about why that is we can have another conversation about why that is, but the short of it is dual carrier is not currently supported and we just can't do what we're doing. The city is incredibly uh, challenging topography. There's 
foliage that is like 60 to 100 foot pines and broad leaves. Anybody that spent time in the deep south would get us know this right off the bat, but signals do not like trees. So that's one big battle, and we need to have as much control over our radio frequency wave front in order to overcome that, and dual carrier is a big part of it. Man, I wish I could have done all the LoRaWAN and the CBRS on Helium. The, CB, the 5G implementation was just a little bit behind other DY techs, so we had to make a late call and change it. Does that mean you're using Pollen, or are you using your own thing? Currently using Pollen. I'm totally vendor agnostic, and frankly, I I don't really care about the cryptocurrency component of it. If the cryptocurrency stack enables a more cost-effective solution for the customer, I'm all for it. But it may end up being a blend of CBRS and other Wi-Fi tech from like a Cambium or something like that. So, yeah, happy to talk about it in a future space. But I got to go around and get dinner. Thanks for entertaining this for a little bit. Yeah. No, thank you, Winston. We'll definitely let you go and we'll definitely catch up on that later. Yeah. The last thing I'm going to say before I break is just a plea to everybody to push for more vendor implementations. I'm like buy sells is the bottom of the barrel as it comes to sell tech. Yeah. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> good to chat. Thanks, Winston. Wonderful. All right. I'm going to invite up Manuel as well, who just requested. I think I'm going to wrap this up at 6 PT. So yeah, about 13 minutes, but I want to get a little bit more discussion going before we wrap up. Manuel, welcome. And then Ed, hi hey guys. If you have things that you're working on and things that you're frustrated about, I also still want you to share. <laughs> but yes, Manuel, please go ahead. My back's just really been hurting today. Like, I just have a really bad case of spinal. And yeah, it's just been bothering me. I've been going to the chiropractor, but just nothing cures my case of spinal. This is such a troll. Where is this going? I'm just very therapeutic. I'm just pouring out my soul to you. I'm very therapeutic. Oh, okay, okay. We're bringing the therapy vibes. That's much appreciated. Nice. You gotta love a good mental health conversation. Love it. I I, I'll just health. sit here and listen. Just, just go on. It's okay. I love it, man. I'm feeling spinal too. My spine is spining up, spining the hell up right now. Yeah, man. And this is my like my left back shoulder, man. It just kills me, man. That's lit. I just been like <laughs> the only thing that really helps is just smoking weed. Like I just smoke it a lot. How did you know that this was a meetup? Just saw a therapy session and I just. I want to tell them my back, my spinal. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Well, removing you. All right. So spinal. All right, Ed, go ahead if you have yes. something to share. Yes, we'll go from spinal to mental. Um, all right. Uh, things I'm working on. Man, I'm just excited for the space because there's so many things to work on. I just got my first demo device and I, have to get, I, I did a little bit of intro with them. I did one video, it was just a quick unboxing video, but then I definitely want to do more in that space. I've got an order in with the Weather XM folks, and then I've been still trying to get a hold of the GeoNet as well to just explore some implications there as well. So there's just a lot of things. And then governance is in there too. I've been partnering with Valerie to run some governance, monthly governance check-ins and just speed up our ability to govern the helium ecosystem and which is probably even more so in my wheelhouse um, of my day job as a scrum master just getting things done so establishing focus trying to get things moving forward all that kind of stuff so that's also all the things that are balancing that so that's also my my like the thing i'm working on and also my greatest impediment is just because there's so many things to focus on so it's busy all the time and then keeping up with the family as well. But it's so exciting. They just keep in the entire space and seeing things keep in motion. There's no slowing down for sure. Yeah, I love to see it. It sounds like you're really embedded in the DY space, taking advantage of every opportunity. And you're one of the OGs. You've been here for a long time. And you, actually, all three of us who remain speakers up here, we've been here since basically the beginning. We're not going anywhere. So I think if there's anyone left in the space who is just like worried or concerned, there are a bunch of us who are diehards here <laughs> who are just going to keep going no matter what happens, because we believe in the space and we can see in our own way some opportunity, not just some massive opportunity in what is to come and what is being built right now. If you base all of your feelings about the space off of macro or the price or whatever, you're going to be very disappointed. But if you base it on what you're hearing today from all the stories that Crystal King shared, all the stories that like things that Ed was talking about, uh, even what Winston just shared was really interesting. Like 
we are at the baby level of this industry and things are up only from here, in my opinion. Definitely. I could see maybe a little bit more of that quivering of, oh, what if it, what if I was wrong? What else should I be interested in? Kind of ask myself that question. And that's why I jumped into pollen to experiment with that. And I'm so glad I have. It's taken the blinders off of a lot of the 5G complications. Here I thought I'd ha have this amazing reception on my 40 foot tower and it is actually quite paltry reception. And so I'm trying to figure out that game. So all these lessons that I'm learning now can be shared back over to the helium ecosystem as well. There's advantage to seeing what else is out there and seeing that overlap between everything. Like Winston was talking about, there's opportunity everywhere. And it's just, and then not focusing on token price either, just building the thing to meet the solution, right? There's going to be no problems when it comes to politics if you're like, yeah, this is the lowest cost solution and can only go lower from there as far as like cost is concerned, or maybe even be profitable at that point for a city government. That seems like a really simple conversation to have with city leadership. I'm super excited in this space. And so it's just seeing when to move forward and how to move forward and where I can add my skills to, to help out everything and share, share the knowledge. That's, that was my, in a recent pitch to Pollen for just doing some videos is like the biggest impediment to any organization is knowledge transfer, how fast you can transfer knowledge across in a decentralized community. That's even more paramount. Yeah. And for anyone who's followed the growth of open source software over the past 10 or 20 years, everything is, it's like a building blocks built on top of each other, right? Every time, one layer gets better, it just is better forever. These are like public goods in a certain sense. So I guess a more concrete example of that is just think of the software on the Helium hotspot, right? That's open source software with external contributors. Whenever there's a massive bug, it maybe some external contributor can come in and fix that. Maybe Nova Labs fixes it. But that just, that bug is solved for all future iterations of the Helium hotspot. And the more of these problems we solve, the more we increase the efficiency of these software systems, the more those these free software systems can be deployed in this hardware, and the more benefit that everyone collectively gains. And we build this stronger and stronger foundation over time, and that's like the snowball effect of open source software. And now with DY, we're bringing that into the hardware world where the software is actually the layer that coordinates all the hardware and if you zoom to the end state of it, you could imagine software that just essentially coordinates any type of heterogeneous, whether it's IoT or a small cell into one big network that is sharing the same incentives and that uses the same billing model and can scale basically infinitely and globally. So that's the end state. But I think the thing to look at is where we are now is very far from there. And as long as the builders who are building the open source software continue to be funded. And I don't know who saw it, but Amir posted that Helium uh, Nova Labs has seven years of runway <laughs> left. So that's pretty amazing. But as long as the people who are building are continuing to build, that foundation is getting stronger every day. And I think another helpful perspective is like what's happening in the incumbent realm. Not that there is nothing happening in, in traditional wireless, because there's always a lot happening. Like in a super exciting, interesting industry that I've followed way before DY was even a thing. There's always something new, but it's generally a lot of competition and not a lot of unification or like building of open source building blocks like we're doing in the DY community. And so I think DY is improving in a more open and a faster way than traditional wireless is existing. And so as long as that trajectory continues, right, you can see a point where DY becomes as compelling and then eventually more compelling than traditional wireless, but obviously a long way to go. And, you know, we all need to contribute in order to get to that point. And we're a few minutes from closing, so Doomsday, I just invited you up. Welcome. Hello, gentlemen. Just following the projects. Love the team. Love the building out. Just the year of listening to the direction we're going, usage has to be the key. That's all that I have to say, guys. Have a great night. Yep. Couldn't agree more. And we did talk a whole ton about usage earlier in this space. It really did feel like a therapy session. I think we got some people from every aspect of the community coming in. A lot of people who are on the ground building things, people with concerns, and just sort of me gabbing my head off about all the things I've learned in the past couple of months. Yeah, this has been really awesome. I just want to thank all of you for being here, whether you're listening or talking. Really appreciate just that we could all get together and hang out on a Saturday night. It's been pleasant. 
Yeah, but hey, I wanted to throw one other thing in there. I've been working with the group on the, we talked about making this easier. I think it was, fuck, who was the guy with the Australian accent that came up earlier? But we've been talking Gary. about doing a, Gary, that's right, Gary. We've been doing a Shopify app that allows for a one-click install of an LNS. So the idea is that you can run one yourself, or if you have a Shopify store and you want to sell stuff and allow people to provision that stuff on whatever and use that stuff on whatever network they have, it just makes it a lot easier to happen. It's amazing. I'm not a technical dude, so I'm just watching these guys talk about it on Discord. We've got a, I think, a channel in the GK server, maybe it's a DM thing, but man, just watching these guys get after it and figure this stuff out, whether it's us or some other group, like that is this, that's the stuff that's come down the pipe. Yeah, super exciting to see. Lots of wild integration. Yeah. Nick keeps Looking saying he's that. not technical. We should, we should have a stream where we jump on with him and that's right. Oh, for all that, you're going like to write this your, whole time your first line up this Wi Fi Marauder thing. There's a lot of stumbling going on here. No, uh, despite being not technical, Nick's been able to contribute a massive amount of technical knowledge to this community. So I don't know if I don't 100%. know if we can label him non technical. Just... Yeah, you just stop using that line, Nick. Cool. All right, Armand. Hey, thanks for hosting this thing. Super good to see you guys, and I will catch you next time. Rock on. Appreciate it, Nick. And thanks, Armand. Yep. It's been great to hear your voice again and anxious to see more contributions in the space. Yep, likewise. Thanks, Ed. Take care, everybody.